turned me a black helper when I first went to work for Williams Air Controls, and I had a big torch, it was a big button torch, it had a flame about an inch and a half. This might well be the most boring time of your life. I'll do my best to keep from doing that. Is that I don't know. This is my first time on TV, as a, and so I'm going to do my best. The only way I'll be able to go back past 65 years is either what I've read or been told by those great people who've gone on ahead of us. Clark being one. Ah who we're lucky enough to have at this time. And in case you wonder what that wharf is, that's Dutch putting in his two cents worth. And I don't know whether that's going to bother or not. Anyway, I'm going to make every effort to keep things in order, but I know that it won't be. Cause, so if you think some of the things that I tell you about should have been at a younger age or older age, that's probably the correct time it should be. I'd like to say here now that I have the best of everything when it comes to family and that I love you all much more than there are words to tell it. Roger, Nancy, Tim, Don probably gave me the, the much needed push to get me to get this done. Nancy is the producer here today and because of her way we're going to try and get this done. There's no doubt that the rest of you had thoughts like that also, so I only hope I can justify your taking time to watch or listen to this. There won't be any commercials, so if you have to tinkle or whatever, why don't you have it stop so I won't have to do it all over? Thank you. Oh. I'm uh, not watching the camera. The producer just signaled me that I'm uh, kind of goofing up here a little bit, and that's what that's what I need needed to do. Uh, this would probably be a lot easier if you was all here and could ask me questions and keep me on the straight and narrow. And Dutch would be a little quieter, but then that's just an added bonus. He wants me to play towel with him. And he quite, don't quite understand what it's all about. The fact I hadn't thought of until I started to prepare this, it's a fact that I hadn't thought of until I started to prepare this. But everything starts by being born or made, so here's where I'll start. I was born November the 4th, 1919. Dutch was born. The, the, the 19th of September, four years ago, and he's been a past. <laughs> anyway, I was born there in a blizzard, and it was on election day. Now, I only mention the weather because that's what I was told, as I was not concerned with it that year. In fact, there was some rule or something that kept me from voting. Maybe the polls closed early on account of the blizzard. I don't know. Dad had to go to town, Belvedere. Not, I'm not sure whether it was Belvedere or Hebrew, to get the doctor. It was west of Belvedere where I was born. And he went there with a the team of horses and a wagon. I suppose he had to take him back, too. I, well, anyway, I didn't go with him. World War I came to an end one week later. I'd like to take credit for that, but I don't think they... Yeah, but I don't think they'd taken care... I think they had taken care of that before I knew they knew I'd be on hand. But I did bring priests to a small war that had been going on since mom and dad had gotten married three years before. Mom's folks, like many parents, believed there wasn't anyone good enough for their daughter. Now, in many cases, this could be true, but in this 
that's when they were wrong as wrong could be. Poppy, Sherman Edwards, and Mama too. Lucy Wells Edwards were a great pair of grandparents and realized it more as time went on that they had the best son-in-law they could have had. Though Poppy wasn't always compatible with, compatible with things Dad wanted to accomplish. He would in later years help, especially with building and woodworking. Mom too, though not one to tell you everything in her not so quiet way, was a staunch supporter of Dad, and would anyone say or do anything against Dad might well have bitten off more than they could have chewed. By the way, the house was torn down not long, long after I was born, and Mom and Dad moved to another farm southwest of Bruni, where a nice thing happened. Don was the newest member of the family. This happened May the 17th, 1921. He was born with spinal bifida, and it is a serious thing. Don, however, never knew, as did many of the others, that he wasn't supposed to be strong. And so when we could get into it, and we did sometimes, it was my advantage to go into the real estate business that is, to put as much of it between us as possible, because if he got his arms around me, the fat lady would get up and start to sing. I should say that when Poppy and Mama too came out to see me for the first time, they brought me a puppy. You know, every boy had to have a dog or a pup. Well, this fellow was named Ted. As far back as I can remember, he was the kid's dog. There was no nonsense about him, and he wouldn't put up with it. If molested or threatened, he would run you down and bite. Of course, through the first part of his six, first, his 16 years of his life, it was two boys answered to entertainment. We would rig a lasso around the yard gate and get him to charge one of us while the other pulled the rope to catch him. I can't remember that we'd catch him anywhere but just in front of the back legs. If Dad wasn't home to turn him loose, the boy in the cop shed didn't dare turn him loose or, we'd, or he'd lay right by the door and wait for him. By this time, we'd moved southeast to Bruni, where District 49 was. Beth came to join us, and as she grew, she was our constant companion. We each had the chance to save her life, but have been accused of risking it on other things that were brought up later as we go along. Beth was born April 18, 1924. It wasn't long after this that I got my chance to save her life, so I'd been told. Don had gotten under her high chair and then somehow upset it over against a hot heating stove. I grabbed the chair and set it back up while Don went for help. Beth has a scar to prove this. Sometime later, a neighbor's bull had gotten in with our cattle, and we were warned not to go in the lot when he was around. We had a horse that was an inquisitive animal about strange and strange things, and one time had taken this bull by the ear with his teeth and led him around the lot while the bull roared. Well, knowing this was possible, Don and Beth got up on the tank, as it was all covered up for winter with the fence going around most part of it, and a lid that was shut at night to cut down from freezing. At this time, the lid was open, and somehow, for a better look at something, Beth fell into the tank. Don, with no thought of, of his own safety, went right down over the side and pulled her out of the tank. Had he waited, she might well have gone under the covered part, and not only would we have lost a great person, but many of those who may watch and listen to this wouldn't have been here. What a blank that would have been, and I thank God for that not coming to pass. We were told never to hit girls, and 
not being much of a gambler, neither of us did. In fact, it was pretty well known that any harm that was come to Beth would be dealt with by those two brothers. This was stay extended to Janice as well when she made her debut, debut January the 6th, 1929. We lived on this place until the spring of 1936, a year I graduated from high school. This is where most of the things happened that I'm going to try to tell you as well as interesting as I can. As I said, they may not be in exact order. The one thing that has always bothered me was Don and I breaking a cast iron forts and tractor to get the magnets that we knew came from full-size tractor. It's the one and only thing that we deliberately destroyed, and that only because we decided the magnets meant more to us at the time than the tractor. That tractor today would be worth $500 or more on today's market. We had a big police dog given to us, and he would take us for a big slide and pile up, but getting him to grab the sack while we sat on it. At the time, we had three big dogs. One of them, of course, was Ted, used only when we wanted to tease him or felt brave or stupid. A thin line sometimes. I'm trying to get rid of my guilty feelings, so I'll tell you about the big shepherd who was always our companion, and to make it easy to lead him, one of us had put a rubber band around his neck. Dad had found it when he did a few days later he would have died. It had cut through the skin and would have, would have long, cut his big artery. Dad explained to us, and as you, can sound, as you can see, it impressed me enough to last over 60 years. The dogs used to get rabbits going and there was a log that they, the rabbits, seemed to know about in the grove and they would duck in that log so the dogs couldn't get them. We would go take a stick and poke them out and watch it chase. But one day we decided to make a pet out of one of the rabbits, so Don held the sack over the end and I poked the rabbit. He went real quick in the sty, hitting Don in the pit of the stomach, and knocking him over, and the dogs got afraid for a little bit as they'd never seen his sack jumping around at them before. He gave the rabbit enough of a start, he probably, he, he probably died of old age because the dogs stood there and watched him go out of sight. We threw a bunch of eggs out of the nest at the side of the garage, and I'd like to say that's not one of our better ideas. Not only that it's real hard to clean off, but it takes a long time. We also built a track that went to a coaster wagon that went down to the E, made a right angle turn, then up over a four-wheel trailer, down and over a barrel, then to the ground. Well now, as Foster Brooks would say, that's not the route Beth and the wagon took. They didn't make the first turn so the wagon got remodeled. But Dad picked as good as new, and we got out of the roller coaster business, and we were lucky as Beth hadn't gotten hurt. Dad had done uh, other plans for that trim lumber we had nailed on the roof into tracks. Another thing was the engine that powered the washing machine that was not to be fooled with. We found out that a good shock could be had off the spark plug wire, so we'd push Beth up and use the spark plug wire for the gas hose, then turn the engine, thereby giving her a shock. That too was given up when she yelled and Mom came out. When it was winter, we always let Beth go first to test the speed bumps on a new hill. We almost thought we had lost her when she disappeared into a deep snow drift, but she came flying out the other side and after we dug the snow out of her, she was ready to go. 
<coughs> she used to hide so we could get her to stand in and bat while we practiced pitching and Don catching. This could have been why she was a good batter. Janice wouldn't settle for three strikes. She wanted four or five. There were two families of Eagles, though I'm sure they were all related. One of the family had a pair of twins. They were almost a year older than I, and the boy behind us in class, but the girl and I were in the same class. The cousins had a boy in the same class as Don. His name was Don, too. And the teacher asked him how they would be able to ask for one to do something without them both answering. So Don said, why don't you call me Don and him Big Ears? <laughs> it was so good, it was a good suggestion as his ears were big. <laughs> if he could have flapped them, he could have flown. His sister was a year behind, him, behind me. Anyway, we used to fight and why I don't as they always got the worst of it. One time we went off the school ground with the idea that the teacher didn't have any jurisdiction over us. As usual, things went bad for the Eagles, so their sisters got the teacher, and that's when we found out her jurisdiction covered that pasture. Having left the job only half done, we somehow agreed to meet on a bridge a quarter mile east of the school. That meant Don and I would have to go a quarter mile north, drop off our books, run down through our pasture to the far corner and to meet them on this bridge. Why they waited, I'll never know, because as I said, they never won. I was going to throw a Harlan over the banister of the bridge down about 10 or 12 feet in the creek which was dry, but didn't get it done as a twin sister didn't like that idea and hit me on the head with one of those metal lunch boxes with a thermos in it. In case you wonder what's wrong with me, that could be part of it. <laughs> I remember cleaning out the tank and it was prone to leak, if not cared for, and the care was a kind of tar pressed into the crack the only time we were allowed to get in the tank. So it was a great time we'd put on old clothes and do our version of swimming. This was the fun, the rest was catching the fish and putting them in buckets and scraping the algae and throwing it out. Well, one time Beth got in the tar, so we took gasoline to get, off, get it off. This also wasn't one of our better ideas, and Beth thought though we washed her legs to get the gas off after we'd gotten the tar with, with, uh, off, it was pretty sore. The cleanup was so that we'd be able to do it next time when the tank was again filled. And the fish were goldfish. We used to call up on the barn and get a couple of points off the lightning rods and put them on a wooden stick. The wooden stick used to be a half inch piece of dowling it was about five feet long that uh, came, oil cloth came rolled up on and uh, we uh, just fit inside those points on these lightning rods. We'd stick them on there and uh, then we uh, would uh, try to spear the fish in the bottom of the tank. Since it was a wood tank, it didn't really do any harm. And, uh, but we didn't have a lot of luck sparing the fish. It's, uh, let's see. This, of course, was, wasn't one of the things that the folks really, really <laughs> was happy about. There had been a couple of bikes left overhead in the garage, and since there wasn't much we didn't know about, we were given permission to use them. They had wooden rims and no tires. The wheels were worked, but we'd give them our best shot, laying markers to see who had gone the furthest before crashing. There was a little incline from the garage down towards the tank, so that's what we used to our advantage. Now, I don't
don't want anyone to get the idea that we were expert. It would be some time before we would have a bicycle with tires. There just wasn't that many bicycles, and the roads and the conditions that were there weren't really conducive to having a bicycle. We found a crow's nest, and there were three baby crows, and since we'd heard they, were, they made good pets, we took them home. I don't remember what happened the first one, but the woodpile slid and got the second one. Anyway, we were down to one before we could do what we planned to do in the beginning, and that was to teach him to talk. We had heard that all we had to do was split their tongue. This proved to be a real easy, to be really easy with a razor blade and a block of wood. What we found out was that it would heal up almost instantly, and though we not only continued to do it, holding it apart, using tape, filling his mouth with flour and anything that could work to try to keep that tongue from healing up, but it's amazing. That tongue would heal up the minute he pulled it back in his mouth, and you had to re-split it. So, but it's not a real neat thing to do, so none of you kids try this. Anyway, we found out that it wasn't neat either when Mom found out what you were doing, so that theory and the experimentation ended right there. That crow not only survived that and flew away some other crows later on in life, but he never really liked us much because of the, our deal. He would go to Mom when she'd go out and he would do that up till the day he finally looked up and saw a bunch of crows and decided he was in the wrong company and flew away. We had a barrel on the wheels that held 55 gallon of water, so we'd fill it and push it and pull it out all over the pasture and drowned out ground squirrels that were pets. Pets. Pets, my word. We got five cents for each one. <clears throat> they would go down a row of corn and just strip it. Excuse me. It really wasn't easy money because many times after we had filled the hole, they would come out and come out another hole that we hadn't known about and run away, and so we wasted all our water and everything else. This may be a little further down the line, but we went down the line, as I know we were older, but we sent some cattle up to the sand hills to be pastured. And of course they came back pretty, pretty wild. Don was ready to ride anything, so we got one two-year-old heifer in, sneaked a brand new saddle that Dad had one on a drawing out of the storeroom and put it on the heifer flashed up to the side of this manger. The partition between the stalls was just the height of the heifer, which was something we hadn't taken into consideration because it was uh, something we just didn't think about. Well, when the saddle was on and Don was aboard, well, I turned him loose, turned her loose, and of course the the place she headed for was under that petition. The saddle wouldn't fit, neither would Don, so she just scraped him off on the ground. Broke the saddle, and that was, uh, that wasn't a real good deal. The saddle was torn off, and, and the straps were broken, so we decided we'd fix them. We went to the shop and got the tubular rivet machine, to, and so we didn't know you had to punch a hole through with, with some sort of a punch before you put these tubular rivet, rivets in, and we decided that we could force them through. One of us got up on a toolbox, jumped off on the lever to force that rivet through the uh, leather, and that's when we found out that wasn't the way to go there either. The arm broke off the tubular rivet. <laughs> well, if anybody really wants that tubular rivet machine and, and Ardeen Mammon hasn't uh, taken them boards off there, she
you'll find it between the siding on the on the. Uh, let's see, I got to think which direction it would be. It would be the east side of the barn, right next to the little door, and it's dropped down between that petition. That and a half. That's where that thing wound up. Luckily, we had two, so it was a long time for, before Dad ever became aware of the fact that that thing wasn't still in, in around. But anyway, he finally found out about that saddle. We, uh, I decided uh, we had been told that we are supposed if we done something and he hadn't uh, done it, that we were the logical suspects. So I did tell him, and he said, well, we wasn't going to fix it now, and you wasn't going to get to use the saddle for a while. So that was our punishment. We uh, had a lot of ball games with Donovan, Van Weston, Ardeen, and Reve. They were good friends as well as good ball players. And Sundays we'd have a lot of kids from town out there. There would be the Lager Twins and there would be Bob Parks and uh, once in a while there was a couple of other brothers there that uh, I was trying to think their name. Lawson. Lawson was there. But uh, we didn't get along all that good with them because we we had uh, had a few fisticuffs with them kids. In fact, one of them had started a fight in Sunday school, and and we threw both of them out through the window up there behind, and that ended the fight. Well, they we thought on the way home as we were going up the street just a block north of where the Methodist Church used to be. Why well, these kids was waiting for us. Well, they had an enclosed, great big enclosed porch. It was all windows. Don picked up a briquette going up the sidewalk there, and this uh, kid, he could tell that he was going to throw something out, and they, one of them was going to yank the door open, and the other kid was going to throw something at us as we went by. And they didn't really like the way we dejected them out of Sunday school. So we knew, we could see what was happening, one of us told the other, and I guess, and Don had this briquette, <clears throat> and about that time, I know one kid yanks the door open, the other kid sticks his head out, and Don nailed him right between the eyes with a briquette. Well, I don't know whether any of you have ever been hit with a briquette, but it has a tendency to dim your lights, and the door just went shut, and there was no, no uh, returning fire. Anyway, they didn't they didn't come out a whole lot on those Sundays because they, they wasn't the most welcome kids. Uh, we uh, the Archer family, Guy Archer, Laverle and Lyle and Delbert and Claire and Alice. Claire he wasn't much into into it because I I always thought he was a sissy and he wasn't a real good sport, and I'll tell you about that a little later. We'd have uh, Sunday dinner sometimes, uh, a couple times a year together at, at our place and then at their place. The thing I remember most about those dinners was the great amount of milk that the kid, those kids would drink. And last if not least, they'd have a teacup full of gravy for the whole family. Now there was five, there was seven in their family, and there was there was six in our family. And a teacup full of gravy wasn't really a whole lot of gravy. If it had been at our place, we'd have had a big bowl that probably been filled, refilled a couple of times. Now, uh, I think I'm going to take and stop and take a break here, and if any of the rest of you want to, there won't be any commercials, so, th th so I'm going to wait for now. Well, I'm back. didn't take very long, and you had to hurry 